Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining us today, recently, second time retired, is Canadian swimming legend, Brent Hayden. Brent, what's up, man? Uh, not too much. Uh, I'm retired again. Doing, doing that thing. <laughs> been a few days officially but uh you know how's it feel how's it sitting with you so far you know it, it feels good um you know i i think like I, I decided a while ago um that i was going to at least take a break um that i'd already talked to you know my coach out here that i was going to take the summer off and take some time to reflect and you know i wasn't i wasn't mentioning any of this on uh, social media but i, th- I think during that time I kind of already, I think, sort of realized that I was retiring. So, the, you know, after making the announcement, I don't really feel any different, which I think is kind of the, the point is that, you know, this means that I'm, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. Yeah. And so, so you know, the, you had some time to reflect. You, you kind of saw this coming. Um, <clears throat> in, in this second swimming career of yours, uh, you know, what do you feel like you gained or what came up for you in that reflection of, okay, I I've done this, or I've gotten this much out of the second go around and I'm content with leaving it at that. You know, I, I could, there were so many different things that I could probably pull out of the last, uh, the last two and a half years. Um, you know, um, you know, it very well known that, you know, a big part of this whole journey was that, that continuation of the healing that I needed to go, go through from my you know, how I left the sport in 2012 when I was uh, struggling with my depression. So um, definitely feel like, you know, I accomplished that, you know, did that whole, you know, fell back in love with the sport again. Um, but also like, you know, really sort of opened my eyes as to what, uh, what my body is actually capable of doing. Cause you know, when I retired at 28, you know, I actually felt old then, um, you know, I was the oldest one in that final. Um, I think the next oldest guy, I think might've been Nathan at he was like 22 and to me so for me at the time like 28 seems so old and here I am um now 38 and I'm like I actually don't feel as old as I did then I actually feel like I'm a little bit younger so um it's almost almost in a way just being able to see what my body's capable of doing I almost feel like I've kind of aged backwards a little bit so that's kind of uh you know this I'm gonna be hitting 40 soon so it's a it's a good place to be I guess um but, uh, you know, just realizing that, you know, sometimes you just need to be able to answer those what if questions, you know, and I had I that summer, I got that what if question popping up into my head. And, you know, I think, you know, there is um, some doubt um, in my head, especially surrounding the 100, because I thought I was going to be just going for the 50. I didn't even train for the 100, really, or unless my coach was secretly training me for the 100 and just not telling me. Um but you know, I went for, I went sub forty eight in in the in the hundred free leading off the relay. You know, it was forty seven nine nine, but you know, one one hundredth is still uh, is still one one hundredth, right? <laughs> so I'll take it. Um, so just yeah, I think uh, you know, just don't put limits on yourself. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you were pondering, when you were taking taking your break after the Olympics, and ultimately you're kind of like, okay, this is this is. Uh, the end of the second go around what, what made that the right decision for you? You know, cause I, it seemed like you would at least maybe hinted and maybe this was to throw people off the scent that, you know, Paris might be in, in, in your sight lines. Um, but you know, what makes this the right time to say, okay, th- this was a good go around and, and I'm good now. Yeah. Like, um, I, I actually was thinking that, you know, Paris was, um, was going to be in there. You can hear my dog shaking over there. Um, but it was um, like I, I'd already written to, you know, Josh Liendo and those other guys, you know, saying like, hey, guys, like, you know, let's go after, you know, let's go let's go to Paris, you know, because like I, I really wanted to do it. And, you know, the fact that, you know, COVID delayed Tokyo. So that meant that the next Olympic cycle was going to be shorter. So I was already thinking that, OK, well, going to be that much closer um, to Paris. It's not a full Olympic cycle. 
Um, but for the last two and a half years, like I'd put so much of my life out of the pool on hold, um, not just my life, but my wife's life um, as well. Things that we were, uh, you know, building uh, together, things we wanted to do. Um, so, so a big part of that was I, I couldn't keep a lot of things on the back burner. So when I was coming out of um, or getting back into training, you know, I started a little bit after New Year's, you know, trying to balance everything that, you know, everything that I needed to take, uh, take care of, you know, especially like, you know, on the business side of things, um, it was incredibly stressful. I actually, uh, I actually broke down at the pool um, one day because like I showed up to the pool, like so stressed out because like I had so many things I needed to do. And then I'm sitting there trying to train, not to mention when I, well, while I was retired, I moved away from the city. So my drive to get to practice is um, quite often over an hour, both ways. So it was like, okay, so, you know, I figured I could do that for at least one year. And then, you know, that turned into two because of COVID. Um, so the fact that like, you know, trying to get work done and then get in the car, driving an hour, get into the pool. And then like, I, I, I just kind of like, um, I just kind of like, uh, you know, it was just a little bit too much for me that day. I literally just like, just broke down. I just got up and like, I just can't, I just can't do this. And I, I just, um, I just went home. And so I think a, there's a big part of me that, you know, doesn't want to keep swimming, but there's, I think I'm at that point now where if I did keep swimming, you know, it's kind of just like, it's kind of like icing on the cake at this point. Right. I, I, I don't have anything else left that I need to do in, in the sport. All right. I had that opportunity to come back to go to another Olympics to have those performances. I got to do ISL that I never had a chance to do before because ISL didn't exist. Right. Um, made so many more, uh, more friends and teammates, you know, and all that stuff. But it was just like, okay, well, I got, I got to get going on my other, my other life. Now I got other things I want to do. Yeah. Which is totally understandable. And that's a big thing we hear a lot of athletes talk about is that life after swimming or that life outside of swimming and how to balance that or how to manage that once you step away from the sport. And so it's, it's great to hear that you're able to focus on that now a little bit more and that is the right time. So looking back on this second career, or, you know, the second phase of your career, um, can you give me some of the highlight moments? I mean, obviously that Tokyo relay, you mentioned it in your post, obviously a pretty special moment, but what, what are, what are some of those moments that'll stick out for you? I mean, yeah, definitely the relay. Um, I mean, like we weren't expected or we were at risk of not even getting to compete in Tokyo because we were, we were sitting in 15th. So we had to do a time trial to kind of get us into like a better, better position. So, uh, so we didn't get knocked out by any other countries doing any time trials, but then, you know, pushing into the final and no one thought that we would even be there. And then there we are, you know, it was like 15 meters left to go. You know, we're in third place, you know, and it, it took uh, Kyle Chalmers, you know, to, to, um, to run our guy down and, uh, and get his hand on the wall. Um, like, you know, we're, we were there fighting for a medal and nobody expected us to be there. Um, and it was kind of a, it was kind of a sweet moment too. When I got to, when I got to touch the wall and hand that re relay off to Josh Leendo, who, you know, he, I mean, he broke my record, one of my records in uh, last December at the at the World Champ. So I, I expect we were going to see uh, him breaking more of my records. But it, it, that moment to me kind of felt like a little bit of a passing of the torch, especially since, you know, he was born after I made my first national team. Right. So so that was definitely an, an um, you know, an incredible moment, um, you know. Um, but I always remember like the feeling I had when I was in the when I was in the ready room uh, going out for the semifinal, of the 50 free. Um, normally I feel like, you know, incredibly nervous, um, before, before a race. Um, but that time I was just like, I was just so happy, uh, to be there. Like, I, I think I just had like, I just had like a big smile on my face. I, was, I just was just thinking to myself, like, how, how great is it? Like, how lucky am I that I get to be back here and I'm in this moment about to walk out for a semifinal in the 50 free at the, um, at the Olympics, which is further than I actually got in, um, in, uh, in London, I, I don't think I made it past, uh, past the heats. I remember actually going, sorry, it's a side story. Um, cause I just won my bronze medal the night before. And there I am walking out for the, uh, for the 50 free heats. And I've got, um, uh, Florent Manadou in the lane next to me. And I remember thinking like, who is this guy? <laughs> like, I've never heard of this guy before. 
<laughs> then he kills me off the blocks. And, um, and then, you know, he, then he goes and he wins the gold medal. Right. So it, it was, so it was kind of cool to be kind of like back in that moment to get going for 50 free being in the semifinal, which was further than I made it before. And just, and then just having fun. And the, 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 even though I didn't make the final, uh, one of the reasons why um, I was able to, to do this comeback was because, you know, I had a few people that were kind of pushing me um, to, to do it. You know, when I was back in Lebanon there, you know, I was, I was talking to Brett Hawk a lot. I was talking with, uh, with Bruno Fratis and, uh, and Anthony Irvin, you know, because Anthony had done a, had done a comeback before. Um, so to be able to, to be there in that semifinal next to Bruno or, or I can't remember if I was actually in the lane next to him. Um, but so yeah, you know, I think I was, was, or that might've been the heats. Anyways, I'll go back and I'll look, but being able to actually be in the stands and watch the final, like I, I could take solace in that, that I got to actually watch, uh, watch Bruno go and win his bronze medal. And like basically do the whole same, uh, um, same victory that, that I did when I won my, when I, when I won my, uh, my bronze medal in London, you know, kissing up the block. Um, although in 20, 2011 at world champs, you know, I, I kissed my fiance as, you know, and, you know, watching him kiss Michelle. I'm like, oh, I've done that too. <laughs> right. Um, so that, so that was pretty, that, that goes down to one of those, uh, one of those really good memories. So when you were considering that comeback, I am curious, you know, what some of those, those older guys were telling you, you know, what, what was the advice they were giving you or how were they pushing you to be like, you can do this, man. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was doing a swim clinic in Beirut at one of the, one of the universities and the kids there, or they really wanted to see me, um, swim fast. Right. So, you know, they have this, you know, really bad block on the, on the pool that I'm like, okay, I haven't done a start in I don't know how many years, but you know, I'll, I'll do it for these kids. And I got my wife to film it. Cause I figured like, okay, well just kind of out of curiosity, just want to see how fast this is. So we just, you know, we filmed it. So then I would just time the video um, later. Anyways, I sent that video to, to Brett and he's like, you know, I think, uh, I think you can make it to the Olympics. Right. And I was like, Oh, okay. I mean, I mean looking back at the time actually wasn't really that good. I think it was like a, like a 10.2. It's like, you know, but for somebody who hasn't been swimming, I guess that's not too bad. Um, and then uh, Bruno just just kept you know he just kept pushing me like dude just do it like you can do it like just do it it'll, like, it'll be fun you know and uh, and Anthony you know uh, give me uh, you know his wisdom because you know as I said he he had successfully done a comeback before and you know won the gold <laughs> right <laughs> so um, so being able to have him you know somebody who's gone through it being able to say like yeah I, I think you could do it was uh, was a pretty good boost yeah. <laughs> that's i mean it's yeah it's just such a cool story it's so great to be able to reminisce with you about it and, and hear your perspective on these last two and a half years so so now you're out of the pool what are you doing <laughs> oh man um i'm doing doing uh well we got a lot of projects on the go one obviously like i'm still working on my swimming secrets uh business you know which is my online uh freestyle mastery course we want to we want to be able to do all the strokes that we have curriculums built for all those strokes um so we're probably going to fly back to lebanon uh to film in the that old magic pool that got me back in in the first place um working with my wife on one of her projects right now she's doing a fitness app um but also like i want to get back into my photography because during covid i built a dark room out of my parents place because you know i'm back and i'm shooting out shooting old analog uh you know film cameras now so really wanted to do that and that's one of the things actually when i was um in isl especially the the first season i did when we we're in budapest you know i brought my camera with me so when while we're i guess you say uh quarantined on that island i would just be out walk, out walking around with my camera uh, taking photos. So I still got to get into the darkroom and, uh, and print all those photos too. So, um, but I mean, yeah, we got a lot of, lots of other like things we, we want to, we want to keep doing too, which, you know, do involve a lot of travel, which means that, you know, I can't be doing any of that while, while we're swimming. And since, you know, COVID's, uh, lifting up right now, um, you know, we're looking at those, uh, at those opportunities, probably going to go spend some time in Egypt as well. Why, yeah, I love why, Egypt. Why Egypt? Um, well, we were we spent we lived for three months um, in in Egypt uh, in Cairo. We were actually um, we had an apartment just down the street from the pyramids, so I saw the pyramids like every single day. Uh, we, we actually went to went to the pyramids on on Christmas Day, so we got uh, we got photos there. 
um, you know, by a camel. We've got our Santa hats on and, and stuff. But uh, my wife actually, um, my wife was a child star back in the 80s. I don't know if a lot of people uh, know this. Um, and Egypt has her biggest fan base. So when we were there in 2013, um, I remember like we went to a studio and all the workers there were just going insane trying to get pictures uh, with her. Um, like we had a, we had cab drivers. Like every, every time they found out who who they were, who they were driving, you know, they needed pictures. We had one guy who actually like, started crying because he found out who who he was driving when we were on our way back to the airport. All right, so uh, so she's got a lot of um, a lot of connections there. Um, so, so we, we, we do that, um, mostly for her. I mean, what a, what an opportunity though. Oh <laughs> yeah. A, no, that's Egypt, a great bandwagon to hop on. <laughs> yeah, no, e- Egypt is really cool. And even the last time I was there, um, I remember we went to the, um, what's it called? The Heliopolis club. Um, cause there's this, this guy there, uh, Eslan, Rafa, Eslan Rafay, Rafay, um, and he's like, he, you know, he works with the swimming community there in, uh, in Egypt. And, you know, so I did like an hour long interview with him there on the pool deck, going you know, with my medal and stuff. So uh, if I go back there, I might, I might do some swimming stuff. I don't know. Well, that's great to hear. It sounds like you're going to be just as busy <laughs> uh, not swimming as you were swimming. Oh, but... for sure. And I've even <laughs> doing the, uh, the global swim series, uh, you know, as well. So, cause you know, Rob Kent is in charge of that. And Rob Kent was, uh, you know, our manager of the Toronto Titans. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be, uh, going to be getting involved in that with the, uh, swim with the legends. All right. So I saw, you know, Blake Peroni is doing it. I know, um, Anthony Irvin, Colin Jones. Um, yeah. And, uh, even, uh, Bruno has been messaging me today, uh, cause I think he, he just found out about it yesterday. So, um, that was another thing I was actually hoping to get to Florida to, to train with Bruno, but it just, um, it just didn't work out. So this will be good, uh, good consolation to be able to get down there and uh, hang out with him. No kidding. That's, <laughs> that sounds great. I've, I've been meaning to get down to Florida so that we can do a, a Miami vice style interview with Bruno and still oh, waiting yeah. for that one, but <clears throat> we need to, I'll, we need to make that happen. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll push him for you. <laughs> oh no, he's all for it. I just oh, okay, need to get good. down there. That's, that's, that's oh, okay, on me, gotcha, admittedly. Gotcha. <laughs> Bruno's been pushing me for years, similar to how he pushed you. Yeah. Right? Oh, Bruno's that's funny. Me. Like when he, when he gets, like, if he thinks that you can do something, he just like, he's just like, like he's constantly like, all right, man, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. Like, you can do this. I believe in you. You got it. You got this. You know, he's just, uh, he's just so like positive and just like, oh, I just, I love his drive, man. Like he's, a, he's such a good guy. Seriously. I mean, you can, you can see why he has that kind of success in the pool when you have a conversation with him or when you interact with them and it's like, okay, this makes sense now. Yeah, <laughs> I, get, yeah. I get it. Uh, well, Brent, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down and chat. Thank you so much. And congrats uh, again on a second career. Any parting thoughts before we sign off today? Yeah, I think, um, like I said earlier, just don't put limits on yourself. I know like there's, there've been times where, you know, you're, you're going through difficult times and you're just like, just wonder, like man, how, how, how am I going to get through this? And, you know, like just sometimes you just need to stop like focusing on like the small little metrics and just remember why it is you love what you do and try to focus on those. Cause I feel like when I, when I stopped looking at the, the metrics, like those measurable metrics and just focus on doing it for the pure love of the sport, that's when I found my most, my biggest successes. So I think people just realize they, they just need to do that and stop worrying about those little tiny metrics all the time and just focus on just falling back in love with it again. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.